life. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Great to be back here for our third and final installment, uh, our partnership with Stake, uh, talking about Australia's future industries, staking your claim to the future with Stake. We've touched on mining. Yes. Because Australia how would we love. talk about Australia <laughs> and their economy without mining? Yes. We've talked about farming. Yes. Uh, and some of the um, new precision agriculture, um, new technology coming down the, the pike there. This third installment also focused on new technology, an industry that had left Australia's shores and may be coming back in some ways, shape or form. Uh, we're talking about advanced manufacturing. We are talking about advanced manufacturing. This is one that I'm really excited about. I don't know why. I have just been looking forward to this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe it's because we've been in retail and um, anyway, let's let's get to it. But let's you're right. This is yeah, thank yeah. this is thanks to stake. You can stake your claim to the future. Uh, we're celebrating the launch of the ASX offering with stake to complement their US offering as well. So um, this is the third and final series, as you said, Ren. So Ren, the past few decades have seen an exodus of manufacturing from Australia. Textiles, automakers, steel, they've all left our shores for the lower energy costs and cheaper labor of our Asian neighbors. And we are not alone. The US and Europe have seen a similar multi-decade decline in manufacturing. In Australia, we are world-class at digging our resources out of the ground, which we covered in our last episode, but rank near last at manufacturing these resources into finished products. But Ren, this is changing. That's right. The promise of advanced manufacturing is reducing costs, bringing manufacturing closer to the end consumer, and bringing a manufacturing industry back to our shores. So that's what we're going to explore in this episode. We'll be explaining what it means some of the Australian companies that are on the forefront of the industry, looking at some overseas case studies where the industries are a little bit more developed. But ultimately, we'll be asking the question, does Australia have manufacturing in its future or is it just a government pipe dream that one day we'll be able to bring manufacturing back to our shores? So a big episode, mm. not as clear cut as farming and mining, uh, but I'm excited to get into that. But let's set the scene with what did happen because manufacturing used to be a major part of our economy, of a number of Western economies. Obviously, it was in an era of more trade protection, more tariffs, mm. uh, less global trade. Uh, but manufacturing then left our shores and the shores of many Western nations. So to put some numbers to it, in Australia in the 1970s, manufacturing was 40% of GDP. Pretty big share. Forty percent of GDP. Yeah. Today, six percent. A huge decline. Huge decline. Huge decline. Even more recently, so two thousand, two thousand and one, manufacturing accounted for forty eight percent of exports. Today, sixteen percent. Yeah. Wow. So there's been a multi decade decline, but it's been a pretty steep decline in our lifetime. Mm. And we've seen some of the industries that have died. We've seen the news stories, we've heard about it. What are some of the ones that stand out for you? I clearly remember when Holden shut down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, automotive uh, manufacturing has been a big one here in Australia. Very political. Um, so we've seen Mitsubishi leaving in 2008. We, saw, we see Ford move offshore in 2016. The very last Holden car manufactured 2017 and, and Toyota also left then as well. So mm. a big one there, but also textiles um, has been a big one. They, it, it was an industry that used to employ 125,000 people in the 80s, um, significant declines, less than 50,000 now. Mm. So um, yeah, some pretty big industries that we've lost over short yeah. overseas. Now, this stat was from an article about a new government body. So I don't think it's exact, but I think it's rough. Uh, but apparently in Australia, 20% of what we consume is produced domestically, 80% is imported. 
couldn't find that stat anywhere else, but <laughs> I figured it was in the AFR in uh, talking about a government body. So um, that gives you a sense of, you know, we've... And, and like, this isn't new news. No. Like, we all know yeah, that yeah. Uh, in a world of global trade, in a world of comparative advantage and specialization, mm. Australia, the US, Europe, they don't have an advantage in um, manufacturing. No. Especially... Uh, high scale low cost manufacturing and so that all got offshore a lot to china now to vietnam mm. um and and some of the surrounding countries but it but it isn't just an australian story as we've been saying in the early 1950s the us accounted for 40 percent of the world's manufactured goods mm. they were the manufacturing was, powerhouse yeah. uh today they account for 18 percent. so again it's not nothing it's a bit less than a fifth of the world it's just the change that has been so felt. Australia still has a manufacturing industry. The US is still one of the biggest manufacturers in the world. It's not about an absolute zero. Yeah. It's just that change is, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs in Australia, millions of jobs in the US, mm. um, and that is felt. Yeah, well, which is why you had Trump standing up there wanting to bring all these manufacturers back in trying to incentivize them to come back. Um, it's a very political industry. Well, yeah, especially because not so much in Australia, but kind of in Australia, but especially in America because of where the votes are uh, yeah. and where manufacturing used to be. Yeah, You know, like um, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, those are the states that Trump won the election on the back of, and those were those... Yeah, states, states, the Rust Belt lost. states that lost manufacturing. Uh, and when we speak about losing manufacturing, we speak about uh, that manufacturing going somewhere. And Bryce, where did it go? Well, the biggest beneficiary, no surprises here, China. I thought I could get you to say <laughs> China in Trump's voice because we were just speaking nah, about Trump. No, nah, I'm not going <laughs> to no, go there. Did contempl contemplate it, I but know, not yeah. going <laughs> to go there. You're right. So from 2000 to 2009, China's exports um, increased nearly fivefold to 1.2 trillion US dollars and their share of world trade rose from 3.9% to 9.7%. But as you said, Ren, no surprises. It's not new news. They're the now dominant force in the world of manufacturing at the moment. So China now accounts for 20% of the world's manufacturing output, which is more than the US, but not that much more than the US. And again, it's not about the absolute numbers. It's about the change mm. it's, it, mm. that has been really felt. Mm. Um, so let's um, that that's I guess the history, and as we keep saying, manufacturing remains a part of our economy, just a smaller part of our economy. So let's focus in on Australia and talk about what it looks like today. Manufacturing still employs just under a million Australians. It's Australia's seventh largest industry uh, in terms of employment, and its sixth largest in terms of output. It accounts for 11% of annual export earnings. So, like, pretty legit. Yeah. And not well, a small industry. But, and here's the but, when you think about manufacturing, what do you think of? Oh, like, uh, you know, long lines of automated machinery, textiles, uh, automation. Aut autom Stop saying automation <laughs> and tell me what products you think of. Oh. <laughs> Anything like cars, um, anything that's made steel, anything that's made in a, a massive factory, all the toys over in um, China, you know. <laughs> <laughs> manufacturing. <laughs> manufacturing. Like there's plenty of things that are manufactured. But I, I, I don't... <laughs> that, is the, that is the quote for the episode. You know, there, there are, are plenty, plenty of things <laughs> that are manufactured. Yeah. But look, you're right. Like when people think of manufacturing, they think of uh, that... That consumables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That t taking like raw resources, taking, you know, cotton and uh, turning them into clothes or toys, taking steel and turning it into cars and, you know, stuff like that. Making kitchen appliances. You, you, yeah. Yeah. Ma making uh, those kind of uh, consumer facing goods that are then sold in retail locations around the world. Ibis World ranked Australia's top. T Top 100 manufacturers in 2020, and I just we just pulled the top 10 because the top 10 are not those kind of manufacturers. And so, when we think about manufacturing in Australia today, the long and the short of it is they're not toy makers, 
No, they're not toy makers. <laughs> they don't make camping gear or kettles. <laughs> they're heavily into resources, which is not a surprise. Um, the number one manufacturer in Australia, according to IBIS, is Caltex. Yeah, well, this isn't us saying these are the top manufacturers. No. This is just like a snapshot of some of the big employers and big producers in Australia. Yeah. Caltex um, resources, Fonterra, uh, big food producer, um, BP Australia, Perth Mint. It's an interesting one. Gold. Yeah. Um, Viva Energy, ExxonMobil, Amcor, uh, Blue Scope Steel, uh, CSL. It's an interesting one to, f- to fit in there as well. I would not have um, cl- classified them in manufacturing if, really? if someone was to ask me. Yeah, I, I definitely... For it's some, like, it's for like, some like the reason. one... So, uh, to f- close out the list and then... And then Vizzy. Yeah. Vizzy for sure. So, y- you look there, there's, what, four or five resource companies. Yep. Uh, Caltex, BP, Viva, Exxon. Uh, there's a couple of packaging companies, Amcor and Vizzy. Um, it's pretty... Res- like, it's still basically just an extension of the resource industry. Yeah. 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 Big yeah. employers. Um, from memory, the construction industry in Australia, one of the largest as well, is like 1.2 million employees. And here we've got um, manufacturing at one. So, it's it's definitely, yeah, still a big part of Australia. Yeah. 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 Um, so, to, to I guess to put a bow on the point of manufacturing in Australia is still... Uh, quite resource exposed rather than like that real like value add mm-hmm. manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they're obviously adding value by turning like oil into petroleum. Yeah. Like that's still value add. Don't get <laughs> yeah. me wrong. Or, you know, uh, gold Perth Mint into coins. turning yeah, gold into... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, or gold bullion, you know, all that stuff that yeah. we keep in our office. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. Um <laughs> But Harvard, they have an atlas of economic complexity and they rank the OECD uh, in terms of uh, economic complexity, which really means diversity of the economy and the research intensity of its exports. So, you know, like how are they turning raw materials into complex products? Where do you think Australia ranks in the OECD? Uh, Pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. Lower. The lowest? The lowest. No way. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's because, yeah, I guess um, we're not, we, yeah, as you said, we're adding value, but the, we're not turning gold into... Yeah, well, I mean, you just go, you go down the list, you know, yeah. like uh, iron ore, our biggest export. Yeah. What's Australia's steel industry? Like we mentioned Blue Scope there, but we're not making steel and we're definitely mm. not making cars out of that steel. Um, mm. that, that is done overseas and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, well... We're not saying there's anything wrong with that, but the government, successive governments say there's something wrong with that um, because they're trying to revive this industry. Well, speaking of reviving, Ren, let's now turn and have a look at what companies are doing to bring some of their manufacturing back home. Yes. Otherwise known as reshoring. Yes. The opposite of offshoring. The opposite, yes. So reshoring uh, essentially is bringing back uh, your manufacturing to your your domestic um, your domestic location, and we've seen economies like Germany, Switzerland, Korea, and Japan all leading the way on this front. Uh, however, it's not about you know bringing back that low cost mass production. We just are not not going to be able to compete um, against c- countries that have that ability. It's about smart spe- specialization in global markets, mm. and Korea is about. Um Industrial protection and chay balls, <laughs> but let's not get into that. Um, so, Kearney do an annual reshoring index looking at US manufacturers, and you know, they've obviously uh, led the way in terms of offshoring to Mexico, to China, to uh, all around the world. But in 2021, 79% of US executives surveyed, uh, oh, sorry, who have operations in China that were surveyed. Uh, are already moving part of their operations back to the US or plan to do so in the next three years. On top of that 79%, another 15% are evaluating similar moves. Um, Now, America really saw a manufacturing employment low in 2010, post-JFC, a lot of offshoring. That was really the low ebb for them. 
obviously the car industry almost collapsed um, before Obama's emergency loans during the JFC. Uh, but between 2010 and 2018, we saw a bit of a recovery uh, in keeping with this whole reshoring index. Uh, the US has seen over 757,000 manufacturing jobs added due both Obama and then Trump were really focused on mm. reviving American manufacturing. And there was an Australian right at the core of that who we will touch on later because he is now right at the core of the Australian push to do the same thing. But also in Europe, we're seeing a um, reshoring and there's uh, a lot of textiles, a lot of fashion manufacturing is returning to Europe and a lot of this has been driven by cost. There's a stat we came across where denim produced in Turkey is actually 3% cheaper than denim produced in China now when considering transport and also import costs. Europe loves a bit of protectionism yes. in Paris still. <laughs> um, and also factoring in time and, you know, Fast fashion is the name of the game, especially a lot of those European names, you know, the Zara's and the ASOS's and, you know, those like fast fashion retailers. I'm pretty sure ASOS is listed in London, isn't it? Good question. Can quickly look it up while you keep chatting. It's all right. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> um, and so factoring in cost and time, um, a lot of fashion manufacturers are moving closer to their customer. So that's just one example. We've got heaps more examples as we go. But I think the long and the short of it is after decades of offshoring, we're seeing a slight move of the needle back to reshoring. Yeah, well, the Boston Consulting Group have surveyed American manufacturing companies with sales over a billion uh, and 37%, uh, as you just mentioned there, Ren said they were planning or actively considering shifting facilities from China to America. Why? Well, they've given reasons for labor costs, quality of product, ease of doing business and proximity to customer. Now, all of those factors you can argue were why they moved offshore in the first place. Labor cost, quality of product, ease of doing business, maybe not so much proximity to customer, but um, you could argue that those factors are now starting to shift the other way. But what is the story here then, Ren? Well, yeah, I think the point there is that, you know, they're saying quality of product, ease of doing business and proximity to customer are the reasons they're coming back. But they went in eyes wide open about those yeah. three factors. The factor that has really changed is cost, and in particular, labor cost. There's a, there's, this is a story of cost differential. And if mm. you imagine a chart in the 80s and the 90s, the difference in cost between a, West, like a you know, developed country and a developing country was massive. Um, and over the decades, those costs have converged. And... In the developing world, that's a story of labor rights and labor in, uh, and wage increases. So the International Labor Organization have noted that real wages in Asia rose by 7.5% a year between 2000 and 2008. Uh, in China in particular, between 2000 and 2005, the average Chinese worker, uh, average Chinese factory worker saw a pay rise of 10% a year. And then between 2005 and 2010, that increased to 19% a year. So on one hand, in the developing world, we're seeing wages increase. And then on the other hand, in the developed world, we're seeing technology improve productivity, which is improving per unit cost. So there's also been a number of short, uh, short-term factors that have supercharged this, trade wars, unstable supply chains, all of that stuff. Um, also a pressure to move closer to home to be closer to the customer as we move towards uh we move away from mass production and towards you know custom and bespoke and individualized production um but really this is a cost story and so i think where we want to turn now is for australia that te technology story of increased productivity and cost coming down and what that could mean uh, to revive our toy, <laughs> our manufacturing <laughs> our industry. Factories. <laughs> so, Ren, um, when we're talking about uh, reducing costs, there are a couple of key terms that we need to address. So, Industry 4.0, this is the current trend of automation in manufacturing technologies. Um, we've got Internet of Things, which we've 
uh, all heard about and discussed a bit on the show, and that's just where everything is connected to sensors these days and, um, and software and connects us to understand more about the data. And then 3D printing, which I'm excited to chat about. This is where we are literally printing physical objects um, through through mass layers and, and we're layering material. So it's a, a pretty phenomenal thing to watch. I would recommend jumping on YouTube and having a look at it. So Ren, this all then comes together uh, in what we call a smart factory. So you've got in existing industrial assets that we're attaching sensors to, you know, possibly in the form of drones. Um, then there's new industrial assets. We spoke about 3D printers, for example. These all come together to form a huge connected uh, digital cloud, I guess. And then there's plenty of AI going on um, that helps with predicting not only maintenance and cybersecurity, but developing applications and all sorts of things. So um, these factories are now becoming state of the art, helping drive down all of these costs that are going into manufacturing. Yeah, I think if people got lost in the terminology there, the long and the short of it is uh, machinery, robotics are doing a lot of the jobs that people used to do are replacing human labor with machines. And then we are programming them with, um, you know, AI, machine learning algorithms to get smarter and get more efficient. And the new factory is not 100 people in an assembly line. It's one person overseeing 100 robotic arms on an assembly line. And so that is the, I guess the story that is playing out here and that is how onshoring is going to be able to happen and these developed nations will be able to compete on price with developing nations so uh that i guess that that's the story in the long and the short of it and the promise of advanced manufacturing of industry 4.0 is pretty incredible so automation in the textile industry is expected to cut production times by 70 percent for simple designs you know a lot of the clothes you wear bryce <laughs> and 40 percent for more complicated pieces um pricewaterhouse coopers in germany predict that germany will have digitized 80 percent of their value chains by 2020 which will increase productivity in manufacturing by 18 percent if you want a case study of the uh leading advanced manufacturing country it is germany yeah. like germany is where you need to look and speaking of germany siemens uh they are on, on the forefront of this uh that one of their board members was quoted as saying thanks to digitization the rollout time of new products can be cut by 25 to 50 percent engineering costs can be reduced by up to 30 percent and energy savings increased by 70 percent so when you think about the story of manufacturing leaving the west a lot of it, especially in Australia, was high labor costs and high energy costs. And Siemens, that quote there, you can see how labor gets more productive, they reduce energy consumption. Um, that's that's the story that's playing out here. Mm. The question is, can Australia capitalize on it? But before, let's rip through a few global case studies to give you a sense of how this is playing out in real time. And Bryce... We can't do any episode here without talking about Elon Musk and Tesla. And I guess the big question is, with every other car maker looking to offshore, you know, Ford, GM, all of those um, American car makers went to Mexico, went elsewhere. Have you ever wondered how Tesla can make cars in America? I know why they can make cars in America. <laughs> all right, well, tell me. Elon's Gigafactory. Incredibly impressive. I saw an, an amazing video the other day on YouTube of a drone flying through the Gigafactory. Um, and it's it's really, really impressive. Largest, but, um, The world's largest enclosed structure, apparently. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Solar powered as well. Semi-automated. It makes uh, batteries, churns them out. Capable of making enough cells for more than half a million Tesla cars a year. Yeah, I would recommend trying to find this video. I might try and put it in the show notes. It really sh encapsulates this smart factory. Yeah. There's, there's hardly a person in there. Yeah, just the amount of robotics. Like, uh, I know the uh, Elon to Iron Man analogy is overdone, uh, but the amount of robotics in that is how you need to start thinking about the Gigafactory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's one. Another, I think probably the most famous example of reshoring is Adidas. Uh, their speed factories. So in 2016, Adidas uh, established their first robotic shoe manufacturing factory in Germany. 
and then they opened a second one in Atlanta in 2017. And this was robotic from end to end. Um, it was only going to produce a fraction of the shoes. I think they could produce like a million a year and Adidas sell like over 300 million pairs of shoes a year. Um, in April 2020, and this is this is where the this story has a lot of question marks over it. Adidas actually announced it was ceasing all production at its speed factories. So they tested it for a couple of years and then they obviously weren't enough or they weren't happy with it. Um, and also COVID had hit at that stage. And so they ceased all production at these factories. But Adidas is often looked at as one of the leaders in this reshoring movement. Yeah. So a couple of others, McLaren Ren, they returned to UK in 2017. Um, they opened a 50 million pound manufacturing plant in Sheffield, creating over 200 jobs and car making in general in the UK. It's been a, a sector that they've painstakingly rebuilt as other industries have shrunk. Um, it's risen from 4.8% share of UK manufacturers in 1990 to just shy of 10% in 2016 according to the Office of National Statistics. So bringing it back home. And I think that's the story. They had a similar, you know, the UK had a similar story to Australia, to America. Car making left the country. And mm. um, the UK, unlike Australia, has a lot more car makers. Rolls-Royce, McLaren. Yeah. You know, they Heaps. actually they actually have a legacy there, <laughs> Mini. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so this story of car manufacturing returning to the UK or growing in the UK again, investments like this, that's sort of what Australia can only hope to see. Mm, um, mm. When we may see in our future when we talk about what Australia's future manufacturing could look like. Um, I think there's one more example that I want to give. It's not quite in manufacturing, but I think it probably best illustrates the incorporation of robotics and how much more efficient these facilities can become. Amazon. So they bought Kiva Systems, uh, I'm actually not sure when they bought them, but probably like a decade ago now. Here's some of the numbers. So um, after incorporating Kiva's robots into their warehouses, it cut the standard time it took to find and pack items for shipment from 60 to 75 minutes to 15. Jeez. So if we're talking about productivity per uh, yeah, unit, yeah. yeah. In that... Uh, it also meant that warehouses could hold 50% more inventory uh, because robots were more nimble than human counterparts on forklifts. Wow. So if you're thinking about just space efficiency when yeah, you're yeah. setting, like that might mean another manufacturing line can go in a factory because you can be more efficient with space. Uh, and it also cut operating costs by 20% significant savings on all fronts there yeah, yeah. so that's uh, that's obviously uh retail rather than manufacturing but i think it just is a nice easy illustration of the impact that robotics can have um and so i guess these are some of the early examples of companies uh building their futures back in their home countries you know adidas returning to germany after so many years not making anything there mm. um that's a pretty incredible story for germany and so now let's turn to australia because this episode is all about companies building australia's future and our opportunity to stake our claim to australia's future so bryce we've got excited about automation we've got excited about industry 4.0 yes is it just is it just something that the Europeans and Americans are doing? It's not, Ren. It's good news. Um, Australia does have some ambition in in this space. In 2020, Scott Morrison established a task force chaired by former Dow CEO Andrew Leverus. Now, you said at a couple of minutes ago that there was a guy who was central to the Obama and Trump uh, push to bring manufacturing onshore, and this was a guy who wrote the policy for both of those US presidents. Yeah, in 2011, Obama tapped him on the shoulder and asked him to lead his task force to do exactly what ScoMo has done here. And then in 2016, when Trump was elected, Trump again tapped him on the shoulder to do it. So Dow, one of the biggest manufacturers in America, probably mm. the world, um, and he is an Australian. Yeah. He uh, and so ScoMo has asked him in 2020 to do the same thing, um, and we wait and see. Yeah. So he's at the center of um, rebuilding and re or building the policy to rebuild and reinvest manufacturing capabilities here in Australia and. 
Uh, the CSIRO have said that over the next 20 years, Australia's manufacturing industry will evolve into a highly integrated, collaborative and export-focused ecosystem that provides high-value customised solutions with global value, within global value chains. So the, the reason I included that quote is because it's just buzzword city. And like, it's just not... It's very utopia, isn't it? Does it say it? anything? Yeah. <laughs> so Australia has... Um, the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre, which is a government body looking to invest in this stuff. Uh, they have a modern manufacturing strategy. And what uh, Andrew Leverus and, and these government bodies have been speaking about is similar to what we've spoken about. We're never going to be cost competitive with China on large scale, low cost, mass produced widgets. And that's not where the government sees our future. They see it in this highly specialized, highly technical advanced manufacturing. And so um, as we turn to the listed companies on the ASX, that's reflected there. You're not seeing um, you're not seeing manufacturing as we probably used to think about it. We're seeing the next iteration of manufacturers. So the Australian government's been all in for a while though. Successive governments have tried to bring manufacturing back to our shores or tried to keep it on our shores. So Ren, that is the ambition of the Australian government to get us into that industry 4.0. But look, ScoMo doesn't pick up a hose. They're not on the tools. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the companies um, that are staking their claim to the future. This episode is thanks to Stake. And there are plenty of listed companies on the ASX that are really starting to play in the future of manufacturing. Yeah, thanks to Stake and now because they have ASX brokerage, these companies are all available to purchase on Stake. We should be very clear here though that uh, we're not saying these are the companies to go and purchase. We haven't done the work to know if they're good investments. What we have done is just tried to find a snapshot of companies that are in the advanced manufacturing space and we should be very clear that in the same way that Adidas shut down their Germany and Atlanta um, factories, their, you know, their fully automated factories, there's no guarantee that this is the future. These are the companies trying and working uh, day in and day out to try and make it our future. So um, it's an important caveat that we're here to give information, not give stock tips. Uh, but we just want to... Look, a lot of these companies I hadn't heard of before. I'm going to hazard a guess that Bryce hadn't heard of before as well. Well, a lot of them, their market cap, it's 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 at the end of the market. We'll get, that, we'll get there. We'll get there. I don't spend but, a lot of time but I on. Think, I think the point of this episode is to expose people to new companies, not to tell them what to invest in. So we just want to make that very clear uh, in this episode and in all of our episodes. But with that being said, Bryce, you were touching on market cap and... That was probably a standout for me as well. So why don't mm. you start there? So I think out of the list, I know I've heard of four. But yeah, the, the market caps for these companies, I think there's there's only a couple that are over 100 million and then there's only a couple that are in, in the billions. But um, we're, we're talking at a, about a end of the market that is, is incredibly small. Um, so I think again to your to your disclaimer, Ren, just just keep that in mind. There's two companies that everyone will have heard of. Yep. There's one company that everyone, every ASX retail investor, I feel has a brief dalliance with and then gets burnt by. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the majority of them are small and um, pretty unknown. So yeah. we're excited to talk about them because, I mean, it's cool what they're trying to do more than anything else. So uh, Bryce. I don't know if we've done this alphabetically, but we've start with a couple of A's. So um, why don't you kick us off? All right. The first one is Amiro, Amaro International. The ticker is 3DA and you uh, are, get, are correct if you guess that the ticker is representative of what they do. 3D printing is the name of the game. They describe it as manufacturing large format complex components in metal with laser-based additive manufacturing processes, aka 3D printing. So um, they've come out of Monash University and uh, uh, with a market cap of $58 million. So that Monash University thing is uh, a thread that I think it's worth keeping in mind because a number of these companies came out of university partnerships or CSIRO research. 
And that is an echo of what we heard in the last two Staking Your yeah. Claim to the Future episodes. Um, the CSIRO goes they, the good. big <laughs> lift. <Yeah. laughs> University partnerships work. Stake your claim and to the CSIRO. if we want to stake our claim to the future and become a powerhouse of innovation and technology, those two institutions need more love from business, from government, university partnerships, CSIRO partnerships. I'd love to see what the market cap of companies that have come out of the CSIRO are worth. Mm. Um, Speaking of companies that have come out of the CSIRO, uh, have you heard of Titomic? I have. Triple T, ASX ticker, $39 million market cap, the world's largest and fastest metal additive manufacturing process. Metal additive manu- additive manufacturing being 3D, 3D printing. printing. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Largest mm. and fastest. Mm. Surprisingly, have a $39 million market cap. Uh, but this technology was developed jointly with the CSIRO. So a company in the picks and shovels space of 3D printing is Aurora Labs. Now, I say that because they actually develop the components that go into 3D metal printers um, and associated technologies. Again, $12 million market cap. So um, we're seeing a lot of smaller companies mm, here. Mm. Another small, or a bit bigger, um, a company that was called Robo3D and changed their name to Stemify, SF1. They make desktop 3D printers for classrooms. Epic. So it's like educational. Like if you want to learn how to program a um, 3D printer and you know use it um they make stuff which is cool i wish they had this at my school yeah well we could, i was just thinking we could get one for the office <laughs> i don't know what we'd print we, print should. All our merch. we, we should we should should. print all our merch that's actually epic let's do that <laughs> um i actually don't know how much they cost i Probably imagine they're pretty lot. expensive yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh and i'm actually reading a note here that they may actually be called swoop holdings now swp do your own research on that as well as the stock but um 151 million dollar market cap the next two companies are the two that I reckon everyone will have heard of. Oh, yes. sorry. Next three, three companies. Three. Yeah. Um, and then we'll do the T's. So why don't you talk about the three companies that everyone will have heard of? And then I'll talk about the company that everyone has a brief dalliance with. Sure. So you've got Altium, ALU. They design um, 3D printed circuit boards, $4.25 billion market cap. Then there's Wise Tech Global who have a $14 billion market cap. The ticker is WTC and they provide software solutions for logistics. Um, they have a global footprint. Uh, and then there's Appen, APX, $810 million market cap have been absolutely slammed of late and they provide or improve data for um, artificial intelligence. So it's interesting. I wouldn't have thought Wise Tech Global and Appen fit in this episode like well, appen provide data that you know the googles and the facebooks of the world use to train their ai and i guess maybe they also i guess if you look at a value chain perhaps they yeah the, the ai they used in feed into these yeah, yeah. these what are they called smart factories yeah and yeah. then wise tech they're a software platform for logistics businesses i guess part of that uses robotics so mm. again yeah value mm. chain i guess you'd call it um, Altium designed 3D printed circuit boards. I feel like that fits in a little bit neater, but you're right. There's plenty of ways to, to look at this trend. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, what's the one that everyone has a bit of a, a bit of a dabble in and then yeah, <laughs> gets yeah, it yeah. hard. I feel like we often make a joke here at Equity Mates that it's a rite of passage for Australian retail investors to lose their shirt on a mining specky. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I feel like a lot of people have also fallen in love with fast brick robotics. ASX ticker FBR. Yes. It's actually now just called FBR. And it's you watch the video of what this... Uh, so they have invented the first automated brick layer. And there's videos on YouTube of basically a machine laying bricks, um, you know, perfectly f- flush and building a house that way. And you're like, oh my God, this is the future. <laughs> And then the stock never does anything. And I will put my hand up and say I had a brief dalliance with the stock and didn't make any money. I think you can probably put your hand up and say the same thing. I don't think I've ever bought it. Really? No, I was super tempted. I remember it was a big thing for us at uni. At uni, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Honestly, I can't remember. If I did, it was incredibly brief. 
Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, okay. I'll have to look check my transaction history. But yeah, look, I think um, there is no denying the technology is cool. Yeah, and yeah, it makes a great YouTube video. <laughs> it's epic. It's just surprising. It, it, it. Yeah, I haven't seen it in real life. No. Yeah. And Bryce hangs out at a lot of um, <laughs> residential zones. home construction sites. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and well, we're moving into the, definitely the smaller end of the market. KTIG, um, a technology emerging from the CSIRO. Their ticker is KTG, $65 million market cap. And from what I understand, definitely outside my circle of competence here, but they um, have a technology that reduces welds that take hours to just minutes by still retaining the quality. Yeah, a bunch of acronyms in there that we don't know. G- <laughs> GTAW technology, uh, conventional TIG processors. Um, yeah. We're going to put our hand up and say we don't know. A um, few others are Quick Step Holdings, QHL, $48 million market cap, another small company, but not as small as the final two that we're going to talk about. Uh, a global manufacturer of composite solutions for the defense and aer- commercial aerospace and advanced industry sectors. And then we've got 3D Metal Forge. ASX is 3MF. Now, this is a $5 million market cap and they provide a range of 3D printing services for supply chains to make it more efficient, green and flexible, uh, giving these companies that take on the services somewhat of a competitive advantage, I guess. And then final one, $10 million market cap, another small company, AML3D, ticker AL3. um, And they combine a deep understanding of -of state-of-the-art welding science, robotics automation, and materials engineering, and proprietary software to produce an automated 3D printing system operating in a free-form environment. So I think, look, that's a a snapshot of some of the ASX-listed companies involved in this space. Any key takeaways from you, Bryce? Well, I think the key takeaway, similar to that of um, the agricultural episode and the mining episode, is that there are plenty of companies on the smaller end of the market that um, you know we haven't heard of, and we love he- talking about companies that we haven't um, heard of before that are really staking their claim to the future and and involved in these industries that you know we hope Australia are really going to become dominant players in. So, definitely ones for me to kind of keep a track of and. Um, Good to see that the CSIRO is involved in so yeah, much of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good first, good takeaway. I think um, I think for me, the key thing is a lot of these companies are small, uh, but when I think about the future of the industry, it's, it's not just going to come from Australia. So, you know, while I was at Coles and you were at Woolies, automation for warehousing and logistics was a big trend that we were both sort of witnessing firsthand Mm. and um it's not just australian companies that these australian retail giants were partnering with um for our online stores coles partnered with ocado which is a uk based retailer or technology provider now they're listed in the uk and then for our automated dcs our distribution centers it was a German company whose name escapes me now. Um, and I think that is probably going to be, if we think about what Australia's advanced manufacturing industry looks like in the future, a lot of these big manufacturers coming back on shore won't be just confined to Australian technology. So yeah. these guys will all have a role to play. But, you know, the great thing with... So many of these online brokers now, stake included, is that you also get access to you know the US market and, and other big markets where there are a bunch of other advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, Internet of Things, Industry 4.0 stocks. So I think this is a great jumping off point, um, but the, the opportunity set is so big because this is not just an Australian trend. This is a global trend that we're watching. Absolutely. So thank you so much to Stake for the support of the last three episodes. Um, We've really enjoyed unpacking the industries that are staking their claim to the future. Ren, I've done a bit of Googling. Uh, It looks like 3D printers for the office start from about 650 bucks and then head up into the tens and tens of thousands. Does anyone want to be a 3D printer sponsor? (laughs) They can be the exclusive 3D printer (laughs) provider for equity mates and um, we'll work out a deal. Hit us up. That's Uh, it. But Bryce, we did say in the introduction would finish with the big question uh does australia have 
an advanced manufacturing future or is it all just a political pipe dream? We have an advanced manufacturing future. Okay. Is my answer. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, head to hellostake.com to find out more about their $3 ASX brokerage, their US uh, offerings as well, and everything else that they do. And uh, stake your claim to the future with stake. Ren, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll pick it up next week. Sounds good. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.